So hello, hello, Irfan. Hello, Dennis. So Irfan, like, let me, let me, let me, t like, give you who is Irfan. Is Irfan Sharif is a member of technical staff at Cockroach Labs, working on Cockroach DB's distributed transactional key value layer. He was a founding member of their engineering office in Canada. So to be more precise, in Toronto, I guess. Before Cockroach Labs, he worked on search relevance at Amazon and machine learning infrastructure at LinkedIn. So that is why I have the first question. So you worked in, at the search in Amazon and machine learning infrastructure at LinkedIn. Why you decided to go to the distributed computing from machine learning? Hello, Vitaly. Thanks, nice to meet you, and hello, Dennis, as well. Um, I actually started off um, at Cockroach. I was I was interning at Cockroach, I think, back in 2016, um, and I was, I was kind of sure I was going to come back um, after graduating, so I wanted to actually try other things before committing to distributed systems, I think. So my I think my my time at like LinkedIn and Amazon were more segues than anything. Um, I found it interesting enough, but I but I think it's not as precise as I found distributed systems to be, so I ended up back back here. Okay, but since you ha have more expertise right now in machine learning, are you applying this expertise right now in Cockroach Labs, or you are doing more like pure distributed stuff? I don't know if I'd, I'd say I'm an expert in anything, uh, and 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 no, mo most of that, most of my experience from there doesn't directly carry over here. Um, the the work at Cockroach Lab is is more pure database or pure data distributed systems like thinking um, not much of an overlap between the two um, but yeah. but I'm pretty sure that there are futures for machine learning in distributed systems I'm kind of 100 percent sure because this is the hot mo the hot most topic in general like machine learning and distributed systems and eventually they will for sure will be fused into one one huge thing. That's that's only my guess, but it will be inevitable, I think. Or 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 we will get machine learning to write their distributed code. Like I, I would I would name it Lampert ML, if if you would say like mm -hmm. there. So so he will write the several versions of Paxos depending on their uh, declarative <laughs> declarative language that you will provide to him, like exactly what Lalith is doing in their parallel talk. He will be talking about declarative yeah. languages, so we will have here like Lampert ML, where you explain to their machine that you want to do Paxos and it will do this. Okay. It's not as wild as it uh, sounds. It seems that there is a lot of. Uh, problems where we can apply machine learning. Uh, for example, optimizations of placement of different replicas. So it's it's kind of part of the distributed world, but also optimizations problems are really good to solve with uh, machine learning. So there is a lot of uh, uh, perspective in this direction. Yeah, so I think... Yeah, there, was yeah. this, there was also this like paper recently, right? Like the, the learned index paper, where you have learned the distribution of data to to more efficiently index uh, yeah. or generate indexes over them. Yeah, like I was that. I was working on that, and yes, they don't work. So like, don't don't tell anybody. <laughs> I was trying to implement it and failed. So that's probably I'm not a good software engineer in the sense, but they didn't really work from my perspective. Okay, so um, probably let's move to the talk or Dinius, you have some warm up questions for Irfan before the talk, probably to tease our viewers a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this uh, talk. The topic of distributed transactions is very interested and with the recent boom of NoSQL databases in the last decade, it became even more relevant. But what excites me the most in, is that you're going to cover uh, the parallel commits. It's one of my favorite uh, protocols. It solves an actual problem, cuts the commit time by 50%. It's compatible with the classical two-phase locking, two-phase commit uh, database architecture. So it's almost like a lift and shift solution that we don't need to redesign the database to replace the atomic commitment protocol. And it's industry-driven. And 
and until recently, I was sure that all interesting uh, transactional research happens in the academia, either by professors or by the PhD students. But the parallel commits made me reconsider my belief, and uh, yeah, I'm looking. I'm, I'm very looking forward to listening about this. And by the way, what is the other protocols that you are going to talk about? Um, that, that's a good question. I, th I think actually, like, like through this talk, um, at least while working on it, it helped me like more appreciate the details of parallel commits because you can like see all the various ideas that are like present in else and other protocols. So, so some of the papers that we'll cover are kind of like Carousel, MDCC. I think those are the closest ones um, to parallel commits. Um, again, all of these, all of these like different implementations, like like you said, like kind of trade off various things that might not make sense in an industrial setting. Uh, but, but there are inklings of these ideas that like made its way to parallel commits in there as well. Um, and at least like going through them, maybe kind of like help, help understand or appreciate the nuance, I think, between these different protocols. Amazing. I, I, I can't wait. Uh, please uh, start already. Yeah, so I think everybody is excited already. Let's start. Irfan, good luck. And to you, Denise, I hope the, the talk will be great and the discussion afterwards also. Cool. Hello, everyone. So um, I'm going to be presenting on distributed transactions. I've, I've titled this talk "The Hitchhiker's Guide to Distributed Transactions," and I um, and I think the way to take this talk is a survey talk of various different protocols that are kind of out there floating in the wild. Um, so generally, after like 2012, circa 2012, after the release of the Spanner paper, uh, there's been a flurry of research in, into studying. Uh, the, the transactional profiles of, 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 of transactions over like complicated data sets. Uh, we started off with a world where we, we kind of have two-phase two commit over Paxos replicated data, um, kind of incurring two, two WAN round trips to commit a transaction. Um, since then, there have been kind of various efforts to try to reduce that to what is a theoretical minimum of one round trip. Um, and there have been various kind of proposals, proposals afloat um, training various things like your read latency, your locking locking behavior. Um, we also tr we also trade off like the transaction model itself at times. Uh, what this talk will hopefully do is kind of walk through the landscape of solutions out there um, and appreciate the differences between various ideas and how they can kind of combine together to give uh, a database of properties that it wants for. Uh, we'll hold off questions until the end, um, and in this paper and in this talk we'll start off with setting kind of shared terminology for the system that we'll be describing. We'll kind of just describe very shortly uh, how larger databases lay out their key spaces, how they think about sharding, how they think about replication, how they think about fault tolerance, ideas that are shared across all the systems I'll be talking about, but also shared across more broadly from more of these newer new SQL databases that have been uh, up and about recently. We'll also briefly touch on the APIs that these databases expose, but not spend too much time with that. The, the intent with this is just to make concrete um, the transaction layers and how users will ultimately end up interacting with them, be it through SQL, be it through other interfaces. Uh, the ideas here should kind of carry over to a broad class of systems. We'll also go over just basics of transactions, just touching lightly on like what ACID entails and the different isolation levels that databases can choose to provide. Um, we'll go over very rudimentary implementation of transactions, starting off with a single node system, and then kind of generalizing what the ideas we want to carry over to multi-node, multi-sharded systems. Um, and we'll also make it more concrete by working through the very simple implementation of an unpipeline transaction. This is the bare, the, the bare minimum bar we have to meet. Uh, it's the slowest protocol, and then we'll successively develop, develop on this to, to show how we can reduce the total commit time latency. Some of the various implementations that we'll cover are Spanner, or the idea in that the, the transaction model described there is something I'm calling pipeline transactions. This will be in contrast to unpipeline transactions. And then various other um, algorithms that we'll cover are parallel commits, replicated commit, carousel, MDCC, ocean vista, and very likely touch and taper. Some of these are industry systems. Um, some of these are academic systems. Um, we'll cover the whole wide gamut of them. Cool. Um, jumping right in, uh, we'll start off with foundations. We'll start off with describing how to think about the key space in databases and then how, how sharding is kind of defined, uh, introducing kind of terminology for each one. 
Well, let's let's start off with the assumption that everything is a monolithic logical sort of key space. Um, all the keys um, in the entire databases are, are sorted lexigra lexicographically. Uh, we're not going to be covering hash, consistent hashing based um, databases. We this is not a hard requirement here, uh, but the class of systems that we're interested in are SQL-like or kind of give you sorted range scans and, and enough range scans or operations similar to it. So we'll be interested in these systems by and large. Uh, but the idea is here should again, like translate over to any, any class of like distributed databases. We'll define ranges as contiguous spans of the key space. Uh, so taking our logical key span um, and kind of chunking them up into individual individual shards essentially is each shard is what we'll call a range. It has a start key, it has an end key that's non-inclusive. Um, just so, and this is again, a logical separation of the entire key space. We'll make this physical, sorry, b before then, we can also work on like adding an indexing layer on top of these ranges. This is just to quickly identify which range we're talking to or like quickly locate the ranges that are pertinent in an operation so that we can find them and do operations with them. Um, again, like I mentioned, having a kind of sorted key space makes certain classes of operations easier, like range scans. Uh, these tend to be crucial for SQL-like databases where you do a lot of like range-based operations. You can also go on to split ranges off from one another. Um, this is kind of moving closer to how we'd physically implement these logical chunks. But if a range kind of gets too big, um, we can split them off into multiple, again, preserving the non-overlapping properties of that ranges have. And if they get too small, whatever the size may be, we can merge them back together. The, typically with range sizes, uh, most of these databases, the, the considerations they have is that you'd want them to be small enough to be moved around quickly. They tend to be your unit of replication. Um, effectively, or you, your unit of recovery, but you also want them to be large enough so that your indexing structures are not overwhelmed with the amount of ranges in the system. Um, some of the other systems, Bigtable, for example, calls the structure as tablets, HBase calls them region, CockroachDB calls them ranges, which is why I'm using the same term, Spanner, Yugabyte, Slog, they all have similar concepts um, to just this. Next, we'll just talk briefly about replication and fault tolerance. Um, this broad class of systems tends to use consensus to replicate data. Again, ranges um, are the logical shard that we concern the self with, so this tends to be the unit of replication as well. We'll call each copy of a range as a replica. And a single node could hold um, one or more replicas. Uh, and you can see how this generalizes to like full copy of databases versus kind of like partial copies that are spread over multiple nodes. Um, CockroachDB uses this scheme where a range is like a 512 megabyte chunk of the logical key space where a node can hold many replicas spanning many ranges um, and not necessarily having to completely overlap with one another. There are several variants we can use um, when replicating using consensus. Um, there, are, there are variants that are like leader, they use leader-based elections, um, things like Paxos, things like Raft, uh, multi-Paxos multi specifically. There are also leaderless variants like ePaxos or other forms of generalized Paxos. Uh, we won't go too much into it, but just a, a brief kind of primer for like how these things differ. With, with leader replicas, you kind of have a central spot where writes or reads to a range have to go through. Um, it lets you kind of like declare, uh, declare locks over the keys being accessed and you can, that makes it easier as we'll see like later down in the presentation to provide higher levels of isolation. Isolation is typically mediated by uh, the kind of locking you do over key span. So leader-based systems um, broadly kind of have these properties. We'll, we'll, we'll talk to th through a few others which are leaderless um, and show how they kind of trade off um, some of these requirements. They're also linearizable. They also provide linearizable reads without consensus. So you don't actually have to talk to a core map because there's only a single node that you can talk to um, to get a linearizable read. Um, leader-based consensus systems, however, do have the downside that you do have to consider the hop between the gateway node where the transaction starts to the leader off the range that you're concerned yourself with. Um, and this is usually the primary benefit of the opposite kind of systems where you don't have to worry about that hop where proposals can be made from anywhere in the system. Leader node failures can also cause momentary blips where you have to re-elect another leader before proceeding with future writes and reads. Um, and they typically 
take a slightly disproportionate load um, compared to the follow replicas. Leaderless consensus can, kind of has the opposite advantages and disadvantages. You can avoid the leader hops. You don't have blips when there are node failures, and you have more evenly distributed load across nodes. On the other hand, it's prone to collisions. Um, typically, leader less consensus systems uh, use optimistic concurrency control and and have and and induce retries in the face uh, in the face of contention. So you you can, you can typically have a lot of aborts. Um, linearizable reads also necessitate. Um, going through consensus. There are various other kind of research developments in this area. There, there's this class of like of quorum leases where you could still have um, leaderless consensus, but like declared a few distinguished uh, replicas to hold thesis. So you can still claw back some of these disadvantages. Um, but by and large, they haven't quite caught on yet uh, with the class of NoSQL systems that we're going to be talking about today. Let's just remind ourselves again how rights at a very high level, go through replication, uh, go through consensus. With, with N replicas, we typically replicate writes N ways, and we, we can consider our write committed uh, when it's acknowledged by quorum of replicas. So starting off, we're going to try to put a key cherry, cherry uh, into the leader node, which then replicates it, replicates it out to the follower nodes. We only need to hear back from one other node um, in the scheme, because the leader node already has uh, the right present, so a quorum here necessitates two out of three replicas. And after, on hearing back, we can just add back to the client. At a very high level, um, this is kind of how consensus replication rights work. Reads, on the other hand, can only consider data being present when it's been written to a quorum. Uh, and this is essentially how most of these systems handle survive node failures, where you can kind of declare a quorum and like declare a number of nodes you want to like fail over um, and the quorum based system will let you handle just that fine. Consensus, for our purposes, lets you provide this primitive. It's a durable atomic replication of the command. Uh, and we'll come back to why this primitive is necessary uh, when thinking about distributed transactions over multi node, multi shard systems. To make some of this a bit more concrete, I'll just touch on like what the APIs for these kind of key value systems look like. Um, what we typically would want to do at a higher level language like SQL is kind of have these constructs of like tables or kind of primary keys, secondary indexes. Uh, and it's very easy uh, to translate that to an underlying key value store. Uh, single node database systems also have this kind of mapping between like keys and higher level SQL constructs. And uh, this class of new SQL databases are no different in that regard. So you can take a table um, and you can kind of design a key scheme where you'd prefix it using the table ID and an index ID and then the key itself where the value would be all the resulting data in that column. So in our example, if this is uh, an inventory table with ID, with name and price, uh, you can see a key scheme where we prefix it just the way we showed above, um, where the, the name of the key itself would, be, would have inventory primary and then the row ID itself. And the value stored in the key are just the, the rows in the table itself. We'll now hop on to basics of transactions. We'll talk over briefly around what asset entails, what the various isolation levels databases typically provide. Um, distributed system, distributed databases are no different in this regard. We'll go over basic implementations of transactions and then talk about how, make concrete one example of an execution of a transaction. I'll call this unpipeline transactions uh, for reasons that will be clear briefly. Let's start with ACID. Just to remind ourselves, with ACID, the, the semantics you care about are all or nothing. A transaction should execute in its entirety. Um, either all of it or nothing in the transaction should ever appear um, as committed state to other concurrent transactions. With consistency, we won't talk too much about that here, but the idea is that the invariants maintained by the system are continually maintained. So you cannot have, you cannot have like your, your limit constraints like violated by the data that you're able to successfully enter into the system. With isolation, the general class of the general class of like issues discussed are the effects of concurrent transactions on one another. What exactly is visible to a transaction when it's concurrently executing with other transactions? Uh, broadly, this is the the level of isolation offered by databases is captured by the kind of flocking scheme it ends up using. Uh, we'll we'll talk very slightly um, about isolation in these various systems. We'll talk about. Um, and kind of show like making trade-offs here can also 
help determine like the kind of transaction model that you offer. Offer durability is again just not a database, not losing data. If, if something is committed, we cannot lose it. We cannot lose to. We cannot afford to lose the commit status of a transaction as well. Um, with single node systems, you can just kind of readily assume that this is offered by the fact that it's working off of a persistent disk that's f-synced to, uh, and we'll kind of just show how this idea generalizes to multi-node distributed systems as well. Uh, again, just very, very briefly, with the isolation levels, what we concern, what we care about, um, are the effects concurrent transactions have of one another. There's there are various levels of strictness offered um, here. With starting off at the at the lowest level, read read and, and committed, where an ongoing read um, can read concurrent but uncommitted transactions, uncommitted writes from ongoing transactions. This is the lowest level of isolation that you can provide. We can we can start generalizing from there, where you can only read committed state, but there could be concurrent commits during the duration of your transaction, so you could read different values. Re repeatable read removes that anomaly, but it introduces the or it it still has the anomaly where you could read a prefix of keys, um, and none of those individual keys might change over the lifetime of a transaction, but there might be a new key added um, in between those keys. Snapshot isolation removes that, but it's also possible now to have write queues where two concurrent transactions can operate over the same prefix of data, but write non-overlapping keys, um, and, it, and it might kind of help break invariance um, that you might want in your application level. Serializable is essentially the gold standard um, for isolation levels. It's effectively if transactions are executing in serial order, one over the one, one, one after the other. So effectively saying that there are no kind of um, th there, there are no kind of like what's the word for this? Uh, there are no I'm, 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 I'm losing vocabulary. But but what, what effectively serializable isolation said there there are no none of these anomalies that are present in other these other lower isolation levels. Now, kind of going over like basics of transactions, we'll start over with a single node database system, kind of show how transactions are generally implemented and then try to like see how these ideas carry over to multi-node systems. We'll start off with a single node. It has RAM, it has disk, it has a set of keys um, that, are, that are the materialized form of like whatever it is in RAM and in disk. Um, in this case, it has just three keys, apricot, banana, and blueberry. We'll, we'll begin a transaction. What we'll have this transaction do is maintain an in-memory transaction record uh, with an ID that denotes its kind of pending status, that it's uncommitted. We'll stage a few writes. We'll put in Sherry. We'll put in Grape. Um, these are still not committed, so they're still held in RAM. They're, they're kind of buffered in memory. It's grabbed all the right locks. It needs to, to prevent conflicting transactions from, from seeing the state or like overriding the state. As we look to commit it, um, this kind of batch of writes that we've constructed in memory is something we'll call a log entry. And what, it, what it'll effectively do uh, is flush all of that to disk all at once. So you kind of get this atomic semantic where all of it's committed or none of it is. And once it has, it's been durably committed to disk. So these writes will be visible to all future um, readers and writers. We can then go clean up our transaction record, leaving over the keys in case we do need to recover from crash failure. So that's kind of broadly at a very high level how like single node transactions are implemented. We the, the primitive we're using here um, for to get this kind of atomic durable thing is is a disk write. As soon as the entire batch for the transaction has been committed to disk. We can consider that to be to have happened all at once, and we can consider that to be durable as well. The the structures that we have in place are, is this pending transaction record. It has an ID associated with them. We'll we'll come back to how these ideas kind of generalize to multi-node systems as well. We've staged these writes in memory. They're kind of tagged with the transaction ID. They're, they're they correspond to. Um, they're held in memory, and then once committing them, we are marking the transaction record as committed by persisting just that to disk and also committing alongside it the stage writes. We do all of this atomically. Now, generalizing this to multi-node systems, we'll see how some of these same structures kind of are still in place, but they, they, they slowly start creeping in like these RTTs that we might want to later concern ourselves with. With multi-node systems, the primitive we have available to us are these consensus writes that we just talked about. So essentially replicating a single command across a quorum of replicas. Incurring an RTT, incurring an F-sync across on each replica on the other other end, we'll still have these like stage writes um, to mark in progress transaction writes that are happening. Uh, 
Um, I might call them intense down the line, but, but effectively this is kind of in progress uh, motions of a transaction. Will then later durably persist the, commit the committed record for the transaction itself, which lends meaning to these stage rights. It marks them as committed. Uh, one thing to note here is that we don't have to atomically persist the stage rights themselves because the, the stage rights were replicated through consensus, they're already durably committed. So it's sufficient to just durably persist the transaction record itself. Let's, let's kind of walk through a similar example for like how multi-node systems, uh, multi-node transactions would execute. In this scheme, I have two sets of nodes, um, each kind of ho ho holding a single range. So there are multiple replicas of a range in N1 to N3, and the same is true for N4 to N6. Each node has, a so has attached to it a persistent disk um, and most of these consensus systems rely on a lower level uh, durable persistent primitive like a disk write uh, to kind of provide the guarantees that it would want to. We'll start off with the begin transaction. Uh, again, that just out of the most naive implementation where we, we start off right away by, by replicating the transaction record itself. We'll then do the same for the first write to it. Um, in this case, what I've decided to do is put the transaction, co-locate the transaction record with where, wherever the first write were to occur. So in this case, the, ran, the range O to LEM, uh, not to LEM. We'll do the same for the second write in the system, just replicate it out, still marking it with the transaction record that it belongs to. And when we're looking to commit, what we'll then do um, after checking any kind of all kinds of conflicts and whatnot, uh, is that we'll, we'll persist the committed transaction record itself. Um, again, incurring all the consensus replication RTTs um, that we just talked about. Um, but in, effectively, in effect, what we've done here is by marking the transaction record as committed, any kind of concurrent readers that look at these stage rights will be able to then consult this durable record of the transaction record and identify that that stage right has now either been committed or aborted or is still in progress. We can then proceed to clean up these stage rights by removing these transaction records so concurrent readers don't actually have to go back and check the transaction records. Um, and once we are certain that there are no in-flight transactions that might need to like check uh, the transaction record, we can go and clean up the transaction record itself. So again, we've, we've kind of shown how, how transactions are implemented using a durable atomic primitive um, in a single node system, and now we've generalized it to like multiple nodes. Let's, let's start with that exact scheme, but showing it with all the ranges laid out just to kind of start getting a feel for all the RTTs that are involved um, in our system. We'll, we'll start off with this transaction that attempts to write two keys. It attempts to write Sunny and Ozzy into this dog stable. What I've shown here are four nodes, um, each node kind of holding a replica or two, uh, and the two shards present are essentially from Carl to Jack and then from Lady to PT. Oh, I suppose there's a third one as well from Pine Top to Z. So what we're doing, what we're going to be doing here is a multi-shard transaction where each shard is internally replicated. So the blue shard, for example, is replicated across N1, N2, N3, and so on. So we're we're looking to kind of persist these writes across all replicas of the shard um, and across multiple shards and then commit them only if all of them have gone through. Um, let's start walking through them. Below is also a, a timer uh, to kind of get a sense for the, the RTTs we capture during the lifetime of this transaction, um, we'll, we'll kind of use the same scheme for future uh, implementations. So we'll start right off, um, similar to where we were before, attempting to write Sunny um, for transaction one. We'll, we'll start pushing out this proposal for this like transaction record uh, with the stage write uh, to the leader of that range. In this case, it's marked by this um, gray boundary here. This will then replicate it out to all the followers. It only needs to wait for a quorum of followers to respond, which in this case, just one suffices. It can then act back to the client. We can then proceed for the next write, do the same thing, send it out to the leader node, and then replicate it out to the followers, waiting until we have quorum. And once we do, wait for an act back, return back control to the client. And then after that, once we're looking to commit, uh, at this point, we've, we know that all our individual rights in the transaction have been replicated. We know that our transaction record itself has been replicated. What's left for us to do is to mark the transaction record itself as committed. Um, in case one of the other previous rights had not gone through, we'd have marked this as aborted. 
We do the same thing. We try to propose this right. We try to replicate that out too. Uh, keep in mind the RTT counters here. Every time we kind of cross a WAN boundary, one way that's half an RTT, acting back incurs the other one. This is the most naive form of this, where we wait for every single write to be replicated, be it the transaction record, be it the individual writes itself. We're kind of incurring a single round trip. For wide area networks, this might be too cost prohibitive. And we'll, we'll show how to improve on the situation um, in future slides. After it has been committed, after the transaction record itself has been replicated, all the constituent rights have been replicated as well. We can act back to the client. Um, we can go all the way back and just leave the system to clean up after itself. So none of this is, again, in the critical, critical path as seen by the user. We can then clean up all these stage rights. We can also clean up the transaction records and go on our merry way. Uh, in this scheme I've described, we, we kind of have an RTT profile of n plus 2, where uh, in this case it's n plus 1 because we've co-located the transaction record and the first write itself. But generally, replicating every single write before moving on to the next step in the transaction is not the most desirable property latency profile to have. Let's, let's kind of like walk through that by seeing all these RTTs in play. We can we first work off by replicating the transaction ID itself. Um, we replicate the first stage right, we replicate the second stage right, and then we replicate the transaction record itself. Again, N plus two, when RTTs, too cost prohibitive to do anything with. I'm calling this unpipeline transactions because we're effectively like doing everything in serial, not pipelining any of these steps. Uh, and we'll show how we can improve on this by doing exactly that optimization. Um, it's a scheme that Spanner uses, and it's a scheme that CockroachDB used to use prior to parallel commits. So let's start with Spanner. With pipeline transactions, um, in contrast to unpipeline transactions, what we will effectively do is not block on the replication of these individual writes to have gone through before proceeding to the next step. Um, if any of these writes were to fail, we will prevent the abort from going through. Uh, but we, we don't need to uh, impede the interactivity of the transaction itself to, to have to actually block on in, any of these replicated writes. So as soon as we get the transaction itself, as soon as we get the sunny write, we just fire it off and not wait for it and return control back to the client. We'll do the same thing for the second write. Again, not waiting for these RTTs to come into play. When we're looking to commit, however, we do want to, we do want to know whether or not these individual writes have been durably committed have been durably persisted, these stage rights. So we do have to incur an RTT latency here. We're just waiting for all of these things to go through. But the key insight here is that all of this can happen in parallel before we commit. And once we have positive acknowledgement that all of these individual rights have been durably replicated, by that I mean they've been persisted to a form of replicas for all the ranges they concern themselves with, then and only then can we just issue the transaction record committed right itself. And here again, we'll incur a second RTT. So we can think of this as the two phases of two-phase commit um, grafted directly on top of a consensus protocol, where the first phase is essentially just like the prepare phase that marks out all the rights that have to go through. And we wait for a round of that to be replicated through consensus. And then at the commit, at the commit phase, we just after having accept, after having received all those messages we can mark the transaction record as committed, again, lending meaning to those rights or mark it as aborted, saying that one of those constituent rights that have not gone through. Uh, this, this lets us reduce our, our very naive form um, of n plus two when RTTs down to just two round trips, uh, regardless of the number of rights um, in the transaction itself. So Spanner uses exactly this, Cockroach DB, circa 2018, use this exact same scheme. Um, we'll go through it again once more using the same kind of structures that we showed in the previous slides, where we start off with a transaction, we fire off these writes, we don't wait for it to come through, we go right to the next one. So T is still equal to zero because it's still in our critical, it's still not in a critical path. As soon as we're looking to commit it though, we do need positive acknowledgement off full replication for, from these individual leaseholders, from, from these in individual consensus leaders. So we'll wait for that to have happened. Um, these, these, these leaders are internally like replicating all these rights to the followers. Um, in this case, we're replicating the, both the stage rights and the transaction record itself. Um, the leaders wait back for positive acknowledgement from a quorum of the ranges that they concern themselves with. And once all of that's had, uh, we return acknowledges back for those to the, 
to the gateway node. So now is when we've incurred this kind of one RTT latency. We'll do the same thing for the commit for the transaction commit record as, as well, looking to replicate it, send it off to the leader, mark it on a quorum of, of, of replicas in the system, receive positive acknowledgement for that, um, essentially completing our two round trips. At this point, the, the transaction has been committed. We can return back to the client um, and then leave the system to clean up after itself, which is cleaning, cleaning up all the stage rights and cleaning up the stage records as well. So that's pipelining in a nutshell. And this is, again, the scheme used by Spanner. So we have two RTTs to start off with, and now the next set of implementations will, will focus on how to get that down back to one. We'll start off with parallel commits, which is the scheme Procris DB uses. And I'll, I'll first contrast this with the unpipeline implementation and kind of show, um, show how, how to like think about these latency profiles. The, the thing with parallel commits is that the moment where the transaction coordinator finds out about whether or not the transaction has been committed um, is, is essentially when it like, decides to mark out the transaction uh, as a committed record. We want to distribute that, that knowledge of the transaction commit um, across the system. The way we'll do that um, is by replicating these stage rights right off the bat. Again, similar to pipeline commits, not waiting for any of these individual replications to go through before returning control to the client. We'll do the same thing for the, for the second stage, right? Um, crucially, what we'll now do is for the commit record itself, we'll replicate a transaction record with a stage status. So this is effectively the system's way of saying that I've, I've fired off replications for these individual, individual rights, and I'm also attempting to fire off um, replicating the transaction itself. Um, if both of those, if all three of those things have gone through, uh, can I consider the, tr the transaction record, the transaction itself has committed? So we'll wait for that. Uh, at this point in the system, uh, right after all three rights have been replicated, because the transaction record contains the full set of keys written to in the transaction, um, and that too has been durably committed, it's possible in case of failures for any recover for any for any future reader or writer that like observes one of these intents to then find the transaction record that has all these other keys that it needs to concern itself with. It goes and it could go and walk through them and identify whether or not those individual rights have been, have been replicated. And then also determine similar to what the transaction coordinator here is determining that every single thing has been replicated. And so the transaction record has also been replicated and, and thus the transaction as a whole has been committed. What, what in effect we've done is that we've replic we've replaced the, the centralized commit marker, which is which used to be just a replicated transaction record with a distributed one. Again, a, rep a transaction should only be considered replicated when each one of its staged rights have been fully replicated and the transaction record that would effectively let you determine whether or not the transaction as a whole has been committed has been fully replicated. In our case, both are true. Um, well, We'll kind of contrast this again with the pipeline implementation and parallel commits all in one page where starting off again, um, the, the things we care about are, are whether or not the stage rights themselves have been fully durably persisted, a, that is replicated, and whether or not uh, the transaction record that captures all, all of these individual stage rights um, has also been durably persisted. So in pipeline commits, we kind of wait for these individual rights to have gone through uh, before then separately marking the transaction record is committed. With parallel commits, we can we can parallelize both those steps by by replicating out these stage rights as as soon as they come in, and also attempting to after we've after we've gone through all the steps, attempt to attempting to also replicate the transaction record and returning to the client only and only when all of these individual rights have been individually replicated. So this this effectively brings us down to like one RTT, which is the best case scenario we could have hoped for. We'll again walk through this example um, using the same kind of scheme we have before, where attempting to do, do the same thing, writing to the dog stable using Sunny, writing to the dog stable using Aussie, um, and kind of let's see how this goes through. We'll start off with trying to write Sunny out. Uh, we, we fire off a transaction that has both the stage record itself and the, and the stage write 
So this will replicate asynchronously from us, from the, from the execution of the transaction itself. We'll do the same thing for Aussie, fire off the replication for that stage right. During commit time, we have to first, we have to wait to make sure that both the stage rights have been committed, have been, have been replicated. Uh, so both Aussie and both Sunny, and we'll do the same for the transaction record itself. So at this point is when the, the leader replicas are kind of contacting out the follower replicas. We have half an RTT here. It wakes back, waits for a quorum of X to come back. That's a full RTT. And once that's done, um, we can, the gateway node finds out about it. Uh, and at this point, the gateway nodes knows that um, the individual stage rights have been durably replicated, durably persisted. And so as a transaction record that contains all the stage rights. So if there was any failure, um, if the transaction coordinator were to fail right now, um, any future observing transaction would also observe the same state the gateway would, which is it would find Aussie. Um, it would not know whether or not it's committed, but it would it would know where to find the transaction ID. It would go to the transaction ID. It would find the set of all keys written to as part of the transaction. It could go and then verify that all of those rights have also been durably replicated. And if so, it also knows the same thing the gateway knows now, which is um, everything has gone through, so are the transaction records, so we can consider this as committed. Um, what this lets us do now for the gateway is it can immediately return control back to the, to the user committing the transaction, and then just go off and let the system clean up after itself. Doing the same thing as we did previously, which is cleaning up the stage rights, um, and then cleaning up the transaction record itself, all in one RTT. I'll, I'll describe now in the next set, set of systems um, various kind of other schemes to kind of also get down to one RTT. Um, and, and it's instructive to see them in contrast with parallel commits and with pipeline transactions as well. We'll start off with replicated commit. Replicated commit is this paper from 2013. Um, and it makes a distinction between two kinds of latency profiles that a system typically would see. You have the intradata center latency, which is in tens of milliseconds, and you have actual WAN RTTs across data centers, um, which would be in hundreds of milliseconds. So what the system proposes is having each data center contain within it a full copy of the entire data we, we care about. And, and what, what the system also proposes is to run multiple instances of two-phase commit in parallel, um, running them in each data center and then aggregating the results of two-phase commits across the data centers uh, to understand what's happening, um, to understand whether or not the transaction has been committed. And, and to actually make a determination for how to aggregate the two-phase commit results across the data centers, we'll use Paxos. Um, we'll walk through with a physical example to make this a bit clearer. We'll start off with just a scheme I described. We have multiple data centers where within each data center, um, it has a full copy of all the data in the system. So you could just imagine within this, within DC1, there are multiple nodes that are individually um, holding onto chunks of the data. Uh, we don't really care too much about how that's distributed. It doesn't need to be the same across data, across data centers. But the idea is that for every single piece of data, it's, it's available um, in every data center itself. Let's walk through um, the exact same example we've been working with, where we're looking to write two keys to a single table. What I've shown here is that we are effectively instantiating a gateway on each data center. So it's as if we're running like three separate databases um, in parallel, uh, where we're attempting to commit the same transaction in all three databases. Um, and e within each database, um, because within each DC, we're only dealing with intra data center latencies, so just LAN RTTs, um, it's fine to run, run two phase commit over single replicas of each shard. So we'll, we'll start off with the sunny write, where we, we fire it off to each data center. Um, so on each, each data center, there's a gateway node, and we, we propose it to each replica directly. Um, it's, there isn't a leader um, for each within each data center because there's only one copy um, of the of the range in each data center. What we'll also do is for the second write also directly kind of address all the replicas in each data center. Um, what I've shown here is, as one LAN RTT is effectively 
us like doing the, the two-phase commit within each data center itself. We're, we're kind of like reaching out to other nodes within the, within the DC. As we're looking to commit, um, what we need to have happen is have a quorum um, of these data centers agree on the same transaction result. We're effectively running two-phase commit, which is two of these stage rights and a transaction record in each data center. And as long as a quorum of them agree, uh, we, we have the same kind of guarantees we had previously. So we attempt to replicate this commit status and we do this across all DCs again. Um, here is where we will use Paxos to kind of aggregate this commit marker. So we will attempt to commit across each DC and as long as a quorum of those commits have gone through, uh, we're, we're guaranteed that effectively all of, these, all of these DCs have seen the same transaction in the same order. Uh, at this point, we can return back to the client, uh, giving us an overall transaction profile of like when RTT, one when RTT, and one LAN RTT. The the wide area network round trip coming from the intra data center Paxos round that we did right at the end. We can do the same thing as before. Again, cleaning up our intents after ourselves um, and cleaning up the transaction records after ourselves as well. This this does have the one downside though because. There is no distinguished distinguish leader for each node that reads require um, a wide area network hop as well, uh, because it's not it's not enough to consult any individual data center, uh, because it might be possible that a quorum of other data centers might have seen a transaction that this particular data center has not. Uh, we always have to incur um, uh, a wide area network round trip um, to determine read status. So in this case, we're just reading the key sunny. Uh, we actually have to like look through all the data centers to find out because it was possible for Sunny to have been committed in DCs two and three and not in one, um, as long as we get a positive acknowledgement from a quorum um, that we is considered to exist. If not, it's not. Um, but there's no way to determine this by just looking at DC one in our example. We'll we'll move off to another system, Carousel. Carousel, Carousel is a more recent paper from from the University of Waterloo. What it effectively does it, is that it limits the transaction model itself. Um, so far, we've talked about uh, fully interactive transactions where you can begin and then issue arbitrary requests and return control back to the client to do any application side processing, uh, and then kind of issue further requests and decide to commit or abort the transaction. What, what the transaction model described in this paper does is that it only allows a round of reads followed by a round of writes. Values in those writes can depend on those reads, but it's not possible to dynamically adjust the write set depending on the values of the reads itself. Uh, the paper argues that this class of transactions is also broadly generalizable to a lot of applications, um, but it lets them do cool things, um, and we'll, we'll kind of like talk about what they are. What, in, what it internally uses is uses fast Paxos to replicate to the replicas directly. So far, another assumption that I've, we've kind of like hidden in there is that We've always co-located the, the gateway node with wherever the transaction itself is occurring. Um, and there's a latency involved from the gateway node um, to the leader of the replicas itself. This is similar in scheme uh, to the one we showed above with leader-based leader consensus systems. Using fast packs, so it kind of lets you avoid that one hop and, and Carousel proposes how to go about doing that. So we'll, we'll start off the same scheme for Carousel where we also have multiple data centers. Um, one, one difference here is that each data center maintains this like transaction log uh, and we'll kind of like talk about what, what this means. Uh, but as, as far as the rest, it's, it's similar to all the systems that we just discussed. We'll, we'll do the same thing where we are attempting to um, insert two of these values. Uh, what, what Carousel, because it necessitates like knowing upfront like what the read and write sets are for the transaction. Uh, what we have here is essentially the transaction model itself capturing the fact that we will be writing to Sunny or Aussie or we'll have read from those keys ahead of time. What Carousel will then do is right away fire off um, the, the prepare phase of the two-phase commit um, in parallel with the rest of the transaction. So it essentially fires off the staged value um, across DCs. Uh, you can think of this as a placeholder value. It doesn't yet know what value is going to be written into it. Um, so we're, we're just kind of marking that this transaction will attempt to write to these keys um, and just make sure that this, this key is still writable um, across DCs. Uh, 
We'll do the same thing for Aussie as we did for Sunny, kind of just replicating out this like placeholder value. Uh, the paper describes this as a lock. Um, is uh, essentially the same thing. We just want the ability to make sure that we can write um, to that key when we work when we are about to write to it. As for the writes themselves, because we're because the transaction model necessitates a round of reads followed by a round of writes, we'll we can batch up all our writes um, in memory. Um, in the client itself um, before, at the end, deciding to commit it or not. Um, when we do decide to commit it, what we can do with that batch is effectively send it off um, to whoever the, the closest data center, the, the, closer, the closest uh, transaction ledger replica is um, using fast access here. Uh, so we'll kind of fire that off, wait for this, wait for this, wait for that transaction record to be replicated um, across all the ledgers in the system. Actually, sorry, I, I made a tiny error here. When, when we're replicating the transaction record itself, the, the, the transaction itself, we're using Paxos to replicate it. When we're replicating these individual stage writes, we're using fast Paxos to replicate it. So in, the, in, in our previous example, when we were sending out, broadcasting out the, the stage writes, we're, we're contacting the, the replicas directly. Um, as for the transaction record itself, we are, we're, caught, we're just addressing a single leader uh, a leader replica for the transaction log um, and trying to replicate that itself. Once that has gone through, this is kind of where we're first seeing um, a network round trip get in our critical path. We are replicating the transaction record um, that has all the rights that it that it, it cares about. It has it also has crucially the values that these um, rights will contain. Um, previously we were only replicating the placeholder values. So after having replicated that what we will will wait for a positive acknowledgement of that replication. So covering our one RTT, we'll also wait for a successful acknowledgement of all the placeholder values that have been replicated. Um, so in this case, all the placeholder values for the key Aussie, all the placeholder values for the key Sunny. Um, once we've received successful prepare requests for all the individual keys, uh, do we then know that all of those writes were possible. Um, and the transaction record itself has been committed, and then we can just return control back to the client um, and clean up after ourselves. This is again similar in spirit to what we saw with with parallel commits, where we're attempting to replicate the transaction itself um, in parallel with the actual kind of capturing of uh, whether or not these individual keys can go through. Uh, and in our example, it's just we're just sending out the placeholder values ahead of time. Um, because we know the full set of placeholder values ahead of time, and then also replicating the transaction record that contains these values. So after that's gone through, um, what the system can do to clean up after itself is effectively propagate the values available in these transaction records to all the placeholder values that we had previously replicated. In this case, um, the value for Aussies and Sunnies are filled in um, from the transaction record itself. And once that's gone through, we can clean up our transaction records as well. Again, in this scheme, also preserving one RTT round trips for commits. We'll move on to another system, um, MDCC, very similar in spirit to carousel and parallel commits. Um, this is an older paper from, from Berkeley and MIT. What, what MDCC does effectively is, is it uses generalized Paxos uh, and, and builds a transaction model on top of it. Instead of replicating values directly, what it does is it replicates options. So these are kind of mini functions that you can think of. I have the option of um, changing the value from four, x equals 4 to x equals 6, um, or incrementing y by 10. And instead of updating the values themselves, we, we use fast Paxos to replicate it to a, to a fast quorum of replicas directly. As, as part of this transaction model as well, what we will do is for each of these writes, um, capture the full set of keys written to um, as part of the transaction itself. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about like how that looks like with a physical example. Uh, but because it's used as fast Paxos, what it can do is avoid the, the gateway to leader hop. It can replicate to the closest replica directly and then all the other replicas for that range. Um, because it uses generalized Paxos, because there's no distinguished leader, it has to reason about commutative operations. Um, and because of not having a distinguished leader replica, the maximum isolation level it can provide is read committed. Let's kind of walk through an example of that as well. 
So we'll start off at t equals zero. Uh, we'll, we'll attempt to do the same thing, writing two values, sunny and Ozzy. The, the thing to know here is that because we need to, uh, we need to capture the full set of keys written to as part of the transaction in each one of the states and tents, we, we buffer everything up in memory right until the end. Uh, so we, we write Sunny, we write Aussie, we're not firing anything off of the database just as yet. Uh, as soon as we're ready to commit it, that's when we address all the replicas directly, uh, sending off the stage values and effectively the list of keys that will be written to as part of the transaction. Again, this is similar in spirit to replicating the transaction ID in parallel with the stage value itself, except here the, we're replicating the set of keys along with each write. Um, because we're using fast paxos, we get to like talk to the replicas directly instead of having to go through a leaseholder, through a leader node. We'll do the same thing for Aussie. Uh, we'll replicate the stage writes themselves, and then we'll also replicate alongside it the set of keys that were written to as part of the transaction. What we'll then wait for is positive replication acknowledgement um, for both those individual writes. So we'll wait for the stage writes for Sunny to have gone through with all the keys that it, it had. We'll do the same thing for Aussie. And once we've received both of those things, we can, we can return control back to the client acknowledging the commit status for the transaction. Uh, the transaction can, the system can then again, clean up after itself, um, cleaning up the transaction records and cleaning up the stage intents. The, the crucial difference here between like parallel commits and and MDCC is this is this kind of like buff, because we're using fast Paxos um, and generalized Paxos directly, uh, we we have we're having to kind of give up isolation levels. We we don't have a distinguished leader that all transactions are going through. These keys, these operations might commute, might not commute, um, and the paper kind of talks about how to reason about uh, possibly conflicting transactions um, and the guarantees the system might want to provide in the face of them. Uh, but, but generally we're kind of buffering up all the rights and like shipping all of them off all at once. Um, again, just to achieve like one round trip, uh, but in effect effectively giving up an isolation level guarantee. We'll, we'll, we'll close this out more or less with another class of systems. Um, this is Slog and Ocean Vista. What, what Slog and Ocean Vista, what they're proposing is, is to move away from more interactive transaction models where the client and application can, the application, the database can interop and like issue requests as part of a long lived transaction and then decide whether or not to like commit or abort the transaction. Rather, what they're proposing is to essentially ship a function off to the database that's deterministic, that given a set of inputs, the transaction can commit or not. And it doesn't matter, there, since there's no interactivity with the, with the application itself, the execution of the transaction is deterministic. As long as the transaction itself has been committed, uh, the results of that transaction will also um, never, never dynamically change. So again, it's a fully deterministic transaction. Um, and part of that necessitates that you kind of want your read sets and write sets to be declared up front. Um, what this lets you do is avoid two-phase commit effectively. The only latency that's in the critical path is effectively the replication latency itself. So replicating the transaction function itself. Uh, the same thing is true from, from Ocean Vista, our more recent paper from 2019. Um, we'll, we'll not go to, we'll, we'll not touch on slog directly. We'll, we'll focus on Ocean Vista and kind of show how that works. Uh, but the same ideas more or less apply to slog. Uh, so same as before, we, we have multiple data centers uh, where each data center has a full copy of all the data in the system. Um, similar to previously for uh, for Carousel, where we have a replicated transaction ledger essentially across the data center it's, itself. So we have a transaction. We have begin. Uh, we are writing two values. Um, crucially, what's here is that we're kind of pre-declaring the set of values we're reading and writing from. So it's again deterministic, assuming that these keys are being able to our, our keys we're able to write to. Uh, we'll write to them in this order with these values, and then we'll commit them. So instead of like staging off individual writes or individual, um, um, instead of staging off, instead of replicating the write values directly, what what, slot, what Ocean Vista will do is effectively replicate the transaction itself. So it, it takes the entire kind of transaction code 
and tries to replicate that across all DCs. So this is kind of where we first start seeing the half WAN RTT come in. And then once we get the acknowledgement, that's a full round trip um, of the RTT itself. Uh, there's a full round trip of the proposal itself. Uh, after the transaction record has been committed, um, what, what Ocean Vista and Slog, because the transactions, um, as long as they're committed, they're deterministic in their execution. What they can do is wait for um, other, so, so well, one, one thing to note here is that because each data center has a, has a full copy of all the data that it concerns itself with, each transaction that's replicated also has associated with it a timestamp that it's going to be executed at. Uh, we haven't talked too much about timestamps in this presentation, uh, but we, we want a consistent ordering of transactions um, in the whole system. So if each transaction has a timestamp associated with it, um, the transaction can has to execute all, all within the same timestamp. It has to read at the same timestamp and write at the same timestamp. And we have to make sure that uh, execution of all these transactions at these timestamps is kind of deterministic. So if, if this entire transaction occurs at t equals 10, uh, all the values that it needs to have read should also be values that were writ written to prior to t equals 10. Um, and any values that it writes to should be visible to transactions at t equals 11 or higher. What, uh, what Ocean Vista does is after having replicated the transaction record itself uh, with an associated timestamp is that it waits for other, uh, it waits for the other DCs to essentially close out a timestamp. And, and what, what I mean by this is each data center is also in the background uh, replicating out the effects of, actually it doesn't need to replicate out the effects of the data itself. So because each data center has a full copy of all the data um, in the system, what each data center does is essentially close out a timestamp where it, it begins to start rejecting uh, transactions that have occurred at a timestamp higher than it. So we're guaranteed that af after a timestamp has been closed, there are no future mutations to that data. So once a data center has closed out a certain timestamp, and once the each coordinator here, um, each each data center here learns about a close timestamp. And once that close timestamp is past the transactions timestamp, it can then begin to ex start executing the transaction itself. So what we've received here is notification from the other data centers that T equals 10 has been closed out. And if this transaction was written at T equals 10, right then we can start replicating out the, the writes that were actually part of the transaction. We can replicate them out to the, to the nodes directly. Uh, and once that's done, um, if there's any kind of value or if there's any kind of value that we that the client needs to learn about or like needs positive acknowledgement for, it's here that we'll like learn about like other conflicts that might have occurred until then. Um, and then can we return back to the client? Again, preserving for us the one WAN RTT that comes from replicating the transaction itself um, and LAN RTTs for like actually executing the transaction within the data center. Um, it's crucial to note that each data center is executing the transaction within its own data. There's no need to ship off the data um, across data centers because each day, because all these transactions are deterministic and they're replicated across all DCs. Um, and because the, the serial execution of all these transactions will create the full set of data that's visible in each data center, there's no need to actually ship off the data um, between data centers. So client can return, we can do the same kind of cleanup operations we've always done, which is just cleaning up all these kind of stage writes um, um, and then cleaning up the transaction record itself. That, that closes out Ocean Vista and this set of like deterministic systems. Um, there's just other class of systems. Um, there's only one that I'm aware of, Tapper. Uh, what it proposes um, is, is different from all the systems that we've covered so far. What it proposes effectively is that with, with all these systems, we have what is essentially two-phase commit layered on top of uh, a strongly consistent protocol. Two-phase commit is also an ordering protocol. It orders sets of transactions with each other, um, kind of guaranteeing a serial, guaranteeing a serial execution of them. Um, consensus, consensus replication, like Paxos, like Raft, um, also orders the commands um, internally. Uh, so what Tapper proposes is that there's kind of redundant um, linearization happening when you graft a two-phase commit system on top of a replicated uh, consensus system. What Tapper then proposes is an inconsistent replication scheme where we will replicate 
essentially commands directly to replicas. Uh, I don't remember it was fast. It, it was on fast faster. So, so what it, what it effectively does is it replicates out data, but with no kind of concern about ordering um, that each replica sees. So a transaction can replicate operation one and two. Um, a transaction two can operate can replicate operations three and four, and these operations can interleave arbitrarily across the replicas. What Tepper then does is build a transaction application a, a transaction application protocol on top of these guarantees. It only relies on a few set of guarantees provided by this inconsistent replication scheme, which is that each command that's been replicated is replicated to a quorum of replicas. Um, so we're also kind of given a guarantee that every set of every set of operations will interleave with each other and uses the fact that we have all possible interleavings um, across all the replicas in, in the system uh, to do any sort of like conflict checking between them. We're not going to cover this in the same amount of detail that we did for the rest of the presentation, but it's a it's a good paper to read up on. Um, it's, uh, it's a slightly different programming model than everything else we've discussed, but it also effectively brings us down to one RTT um, for the same kind of serializable guarantees um, that we've had so far. In summary, this is kind of where we're at. Um, with Spanner and Pipeline transactions, that's kind of our baseline that we started off with. Uh, we had a world where we can commit a transaction in two round trips, one waiting for all the stage writes to go through, one waiting for the transaction record itself to be replicated. With parallel commits, we can like, do both of those things in parallel by, by replicating out a staging transaction record that contains the list of staged, the, the list of keys written to as part of the transaction itself. Um, this is so that any future observer, should there be a coordinator crash, um, is able to recover the status of the transaction, whether or not it was aborted, whether or not it was committed, by then kind of consulting um, all the individual stage rights listed out as part of the transaction record um, and looking at the transaction record itself. With replicated commit, uh, we, were, we were also down to one, R one WAN RTT effectively by running multiple instances of two-phase commit in parallel across data centers um, and then reasoning about all those individual two-phase commit results um, by using Paxos across them. Uh, this is again effectively like running multiple instances of the database where each instance um, is able to run two-phase commit within one LAN RTT um, among all the replicas that it has, um, and then reasoning about like what the overall commit status is for across the multiple databases. This has the one downside that reads actually do have to consult um, a quorum of DCs. It has to incur a WAN RTT, uh, but it still kind of gives you the same kind of guarantees that we have um, elsewhere. With Carousel, we limit the transaction model to again, have only one round of reads were followed by one round of writes. Um, what we what Carousel does is send out these like sends out these lock requests in parallel uh, with the transact sends out these lock requests and then buffer all the writes and then ships off uh, the set of writes as a separate transaction record that's replicated using the WAN RTT. Um, in parallel with the replication of the WAN, WAN RTT is the coordinator effectively waiting for all those for all those um, individual writes to have gone through. With MDCC, uh, what it proposes is using a generalized Paxos scheme um, and effectively replicating out to, the replica, to all the replicas directly, avoiding a gateway to leader hop. Uh, what this gives up, because there's no central point of ordering, is the highest level of isolation it can provide. It can provide read committed only. Though I think it avoids the lost update problem. With MDCC, with, with Slog and Ocean Vista, uh, what they do is again changing out the transaction model, making sure that the transactions as a whole are wholly deterministic, so there's no client-side application involvement um, during the execution of the transaction. And then it essentially, by, by replicating out the transaction using one RT, one, one RT, one RTT, uh, what we can then do uh, is avoid avoid kind of like aborts coming in the way. Um, it, we can, as long as the transaction itself has been replicated, um, as long as everything else is deterministic, um, we can we can kind of return back to the client as soon as the transaction itself has been um, has been replicated. And if if there are kind of results that we need to wait on, we do have to wait for the execution of the transaction. Uh, but it can still all happen within one one RTT. With with Tapper, we haven't discussed it too much, so but effectively what it proposes is replicating out uh, the transactions operations inconsistently across replicas um, and relying on inconsistent replication to provide the guarantee that. Um, operations between transactions will at least overlap once um, at some point. Um, so 
we can do any sort of context checking um, on these individual replicas and then provide higher level guarantees on top of it. This covers the, the wide gamut of systems um, and kind of different ideas floating around in the space, all trying to kind of approach when R one when RTT for transaction commits. Um, I will close this out by kind of opening up the floor to, to questions. Uh, there was a lot to have gone through um, and these slides will be kind of available after the fact. Uh, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, uh, very inspiring and I think I got, uh, uh, so I have one more question answered during the talk that I was uh, curious about the parallel commits. So I, I found, I definitely found something new uh, here. It, uh, it seems that uh, everybody uh, a little bit shy to ask questions. So I will use this uh, opportunity for myself to ask questions that are interested to me. Uh, so thank you audience for being shy. Uh, so first question is uh, about the parallel commits. So you previously had one system, so more like a classical two-phase commit or like spreader commit as I understand. And then at some point of time you, change this uh, protocol to parallel commits. And I'm uh, curious what the effect was on the cockroach uh, DB itself. Was the effect always positive or some of the workflow became uh, um, uh, not so, kind of uh, has some flaws compared to the previous implementation? Um, that, that's, a, that's a good question. So with, with, with parallel commits, um, I think it was mostly a net positive operation. They're kind of very, very hard to find downsides. I think in all cases, it kind of like reduces, like what it effectively does is it reduces the the, the time to like acknowledge commits, but the, but the work in the system is still the same. Uh, we still have to go and like clean up these these stage intents um, as we did before for, for like ongoing transactions. The only maybe downside is that uh, the transaction record itself because it contains the full set of keys is a bit more bloated than it was before. Uh, but with, with the kind of transactions that we typically see at Talkert, where they're not super large transactions, they're, they're quite small, um, this too wasn't that much of an effect. Um, so I think overall there was, there was an optimization that was kind of like net positive in all sides with very little downsides um, to have. Uh, uh, got it, uh, thank you. I, th I think we are running out of time, so let's uh, uh, continue the Q&A session and uh, uh, dedicate it to uh, uh, Zoom room. Yeah, cool. the, thank you very much for the talk, Fran. Uh, there, the funniest part that it happened as I, as I said, right? So this is either nobody comes, I thought that this is excellent talk, but I would think that this is the excellent talk. So like we have, there are no questions because everybody was clear. Everything was clear and everybody understood everything. Like I'm pretty sure that it was that because like this was clear and open. Okay, so I, I don't know, by myself I don't, uh, I also don't have any questions, but the talk was really nice. I cannot argue with that. So yeah, then, I think it was uh, excellent. Yeah. So uh, what what I can say else that we should move to the Zoom session with the Q, Q and A session. Continue. I guess Denise has a lot of questions prepared for you. So good luck. Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, good, good luck answering them. I am pretty sure they're tricky because De Denise is kind of a foxy guy. He will prepare you. Okay. Uh, good luck then on there. Thank you very much again and see you. See you.